So I want to welcome onto the couch uh, Christina de Medel. Welcome. Thanks, Martin. Uh, so you've been a photographer for how many years? I don't really know. Is it five years or twenty years? Uh, it's seventeen. The first seventeen. Time I saw my first my first picture to a newspaper in two thousand two, but I was taking pictures before that. And how did you get to learn about the possibilities of what photography could offer you? For me, it was uh, working in in newspapers, like photojournalism, and that space of time, the time it took me to get disappointed with it and expand my horizon with uh, more creative work. But it was like maybe 10 years as a photojournalist and then in 2012, the Afronauts, that actually just confirmed for me the, the possibilities of it and it's been I've been exploring that since then. So were you a self-taught photographer or did you go and do a, some kind of training for working as a photojournalist? Half and half. Uh, I, was, I was trained in fine arts. I was doing drawings and, and comic books. So I was already telling pictures with, uh, with images. And I used photography just to facilitate that work and that translation. Uh, and then, yes, I studied my last year in, in college was in Oklahoma. And I did a full year on technical photography. That's where the, the technical aspect it was learned, but then in the newspaper is where I learned most of what I But know. when you were learning this technical thing, did you imagine that you'd be in the newspaper industry as a career? <laughs> I, I didn't imagine any of the things that happened to me when I was studying. Nothing. Nothing. It was very intuitive and I just liked the camera and, uh, and go, being out there taking pictures. And I didn't plan anything. I'm not a good uh, strategist. <laughs> and when you're doing this uh, this newspaper job, did you have to do what ten shots a day? You have to rush around like an idiot. It depends. Sometimes more than that. And I was working in very small newspapers, so I had to do like you know like the children league of basketball in you know with very bad lighting in the in the in, in Ibiza, and also I don't know like uh, the problem with dogs. Uh, shitting in the parks and things like that, <laughs> this type of thing. So I'm surprised my... you haven't done a book on that. <laughs> no, well, I, I could go back to my archive. Uh, they might find some treasures. But then on my on my holidays, I would just uh, collaborate with NGOs because I wanted to travel and, and also learn a little bit more than the problem with the dogs in my hometown. So I went to Bangladesh, to Haiti a couple of times, to Syria, to... I, I did uh, the, the all the stages to become a, a war photographer, but then I didn't like it. So I don't blame you really, because no. uh, war is a difficult place to go to. It is. And and then along comes Afronauts. We have a copy of the first edition here. By the way, the rubber band has gone. It, I it, know. It went. I know. It it was it was not meant to stay forever. It was. Just, <laughs> I don't know. I'm making up this, but uh, it it was not supposed to be such an important book. And I think the design and all the materials uh, were made just for a sort of like expanded catalog. And uh, no nobody and me, the last one, uh, could predict what would happen with this book. Maybe we would have chosen a better material for the rubber band. So if, if I get a short list of rubber bands, will you help me select? Oh, yes, I can do that, yeah. <laughs> but tell me, how did this idea come about? I mean, it seems the most crazy idea to go from a newspaper photographer to, to producing something about a phantom space exploration. <laughs> I think uh, the last year I was in newspapers, I was already very disappointed, especially because if you if you go to Syria and all these places and you see how the world is explained to you on, on the media, and then you see what is really happening, then you, it's very, I don't know, you can, you decide to join the monster or to fight against it. Mm -hmm. I decided to fight against it and, and realize that before I could change the world with photography, which is what I wanted in the beginning, I had to change photography first. <laughs> so I started like all my obsession became to question photography and to question the way we represent the world. So that with uh, my love for uh, science fiction and absurdity and irony that I could really not explore in newspapers. I just gave myself one year, a sabbatical year, where I would do whatever I wanted, regardless of the consequences, and here I am. And how did you come across this incredible story in Zambia of them actually, <laughs> I, I, I guess in all seriousness, or was it? No, no, it was. Trying it was to serious, send someone up serious. into space. No, it was, they were serious about it, but uh, also very naive because they didn't have like the technical capacity to do it, but they were totally serious. And that's what I really loved about the, the story. Not that they failed, not that it was in Africa, but that their full faith in, in, in seeing it happen. So I just found it because I was doing research on, on like scientific experiments, some things that, re things that really happen and that are validated by science, but that are completely crazy. Like, uh, 
like the psychological experiments that was in the US in the 40s where they would trade pigeons to play ping pong and all this, you know, like uh, all that preceded the psychology of behavior to train soldiers. That's crazy mm -hmm. experiments. So I was just surfing the web to find crazy experiments and I ended up in a page with the 10 most crazy experiments. First one was this one, and, and then the ray of light came to me. <laughs> but did you know immediately that you had to uh, create these new astronauts and photograph yes, them? Yes, and... yes. It was, for me, clear that I had to do something because I, I was first caught in that trap. I, when I saw the video of, uh, of what really happened, I thought it was von Cuberta that had mm -hmm. put together something to, to again fool everyone. And I was myself, you know, being the victim of the game I wanted to play. <laughs> it had all the ingredients for that. It had uh, our prejudice for Africa, it had our, our blind faith in photography and space. That is something that fascinates everyone. Mm -hmm. So there was definitely something to do about it. I didn't know how and what and to do. And how long did it take you to create these pictures? I mean, was it a period of months or mm -hmm. years or? It started pretty quickly, like uh, once I had the idea, I just start, started shooting in my hometown in Alicante. I found a model, I had my grandmother to make the costume and so on. Uh, but then I was, uh, in this sabbatical year, I was traveling to Palestine to, to work with the uh, steelwork with Red Cross and, and other places. And I was shooting the astronauts uh, in all these places, in China, in Palestine, you know, because I could see astronauts everywhere. Uh, I think I did like seven shootings. Mm -hmm. That's how it is in my archive. And then the, the important part of making the book that I think is what actually just, uh, because it, otherwise it would be just a series of images, but the book really. Yeah. Um, so I assume you created a dummy or something like this. We, we did a couple of dummies. I was working with Ramon Peth and Lai Abril at the time that um, I mean, now they are also like very famous and, mm -hmm. and very consolidated. Uh, and it was, I think, our first book for, for all of us, a photo mm -hmm. book. So we, were, we didn't have any, anything to respect. And, and it was an published object. by the University of Cadiz. And how how does that uh, how did they find you, or did you go and find them? It was uh, I went to a festival. I was invited to a festival, a very special festival because it's not like the portfolio review where you go and show the work to to the reviewer. You actually like have like a stall, and you put your work there, and they come to visit you as mm -hmm. if it was a market. And I was selected with the astronauts. Just I just had like ten or fifteen images, mm -hmm. and the guy, the curator. Uh, Jesus Miko from, from the university came and he was like, hey, we're going to do a book. But it's, it's like, uh, I mean, they gave us support. They gave like uh, 2,500 euros mm -hmm. to make a book and an exhibition. And they mm -hmm. had to keep 400 copies of the catalog. So it's, it's uh, like um, support, but it's more like they gave me a deadline and I invested. Okay. Okay. And then how many books? Uh, so did they sell the 400 or? They gave them away because it's a catalog. They, they, send in to, they send them to all the curators and people who are collectors and so on. So they present your work to the Spanish photography like mm -hmm. uh, environment. And, and the rest, I printed 600 more mm -hmm. that, um, that I sold and I mean, in Arles. That, uh, exactly, yes, because <laughs> yes. I, I remember um, us meeting very early on. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who showed you the book? I, I always think, wanted um, to ask you. No, no, that. let me think. So I think what happened was someone told me about it. It may have been someone called John, it might have been John Gossage, the photographer, mm -hmm. who said, I've just seen this book. Uh, it's fantastic. You should try and get hold of mm -hmm. it. Um, so I remember writing to you, we had this fantastic yes. incident. I wrote to you, and then uh, uh, you wrote back, and then half an hour later, we're having a yeah, coffee. Yes, yes, yes. No, we, it was, we, I think. We both happened to be at the R Festival. Mm -hmm. And then I think. Um, there are other people that we showed it to literally that day. So mm -hmm. then within a few weeks, of course, the buzzword was mm -hmm. out and um, mm -hmm. the rest, as we know, is history. When you look back on this whole thing of the Afronauts, I mean, it's as much a blessing and a curse. I mean, do you feel that, uh, in a sense, I mean, obviously helped to make your name, but do you think there's a downside to that sort of instant fame that you received with mm -hmm. this uh, amazing book? Uh, at this point, I don't see a downside, but it was difficult to, to manage uh, in the beginning because I was coming from nothing and, and then all of a sudden I'm a white woman talking about Africa. That is also a delicate uh, matter. And I felt that I need, it, was, it was difficult for me to, to manage, but I just decided to just run forward and, and run away from that and make more work and make more work so I could uh, mm -hmm. also validate myself to me to see if it was just like uh, I had been lucky or there was something more. So there was a lot to, that I wanted to find about myself. 
I think the well, the Afronauts of course has opened so many doors for me, but still now after seven years, I keep talking about the Afronauts. It's starting to get a bit boring. But yes, no, I can imagine that. <laughs> and then, of course, I mean, in the in the in the five years or so since was it five seven. years? Seven. Is it seven? Wow, mm -hmm. how time flies. I mean, you've done many books. Just a few of them are here. Thirteen. Wow. I have a personal race. I want to catch your <laughs> <laughs> publication rhythm. <laughs> and I mean, the thing I really love about what you do is the energy with which you go to these projects and you find them and you do them and you get them out. I mean, you don't mess about. You you, mm. you just finish them and get them out. But do you always feel that, um, you know, obviously, if you do 13 projects, I can say this myself, I've done over 100 books. Not all of them are great. Oh, some are okay. So and some... <laughs> And some really sort of hit the spot. I mean, do you feel you've been pretty consistent in the projects that you've done since then? For me, well, there's, uh, I think, uh, out of the 30, maybe four or five that I think are, are projects where I gave all my soul and everything and that, were, that I learned also doing them. And others that are just like exercises. And for me, a project is, is an idea and the time I dedicate to something, to an idea, and, and the time it takes me to translate this idea into a book or an exhibition or whatever. Some are important, some are better than others. But for me, it's the way of getting out of, <laughs> getting rid of that idea and so I can focus on the next one. I don't pretend to have all my work to be like, become classical or anything like that for me. I, and also, I think I do it for myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the the truth is that I do it for myself. And do these projects are they self initiated or is it an invitation? I mean, how do they come about? Mm, sometimes, most of the time, it's self initiated, uh, but there's also more and more uh, commissions and and sometimes they they I have an assignment and I just do it, but then it becomes something else because it uh, there's uh, things that I discover that I believe are worth it. But uh, it's really a mix, and now with Magnum, it's becoming even more of a mix. Mm -hmm. I have eventually less time for my <laughs> personal projects. <laughs> Why don't we talk about one of these? I mean, do, do you want to just say, I mean, here, I'm just picking this book up here. Yeah. It's a pretty interesting one. I'm doing a lot of collaborations now. This is with, uh, with Bruno Moraes, who's uh, my husband that I met doing this book. Mm -hmm. So there's like a history. My life is also transforming with the books. Um, this was in actually it's a, it's a, this is sort of a commission I was doing a residency uh, because in, a in in Rio because a collector saw the book that I had done in uh, in a slum in in Lagos and he wanted she wanted me to to try and do something similar in in the favelas in Rio so give my point of view on the favelas so I was there a couple of times and and my guide in favelas is uh, Bruno Morales that is my husband now. So uh, talking to him, um, this is like turning, transforming the favelas into the underwater world, like to express how it is like, like an oppressive environment and, and how actually everyone has its role. Police are the sharks and the little fish are the people who live there and how you can explain the dynamics uh, without blaming anyone and just being like they are victims of a bigger system. So you arrive at something like a, a favel and you have to then think of the story that is going to be your story, mm -hmm. your take on it. Is Mo that is that a clear process or is it, it something, is, is it, does it come to you in a lightning flash or is it something you evolve over a number of weeks? Sometimes, most of the time I have a very clear idea of what I want to do because I've done some research before. I'm, uh, many times it's like uh, subjects that have been addressed many times classically in the media and mm -hmm. I want just to give a... Uh, like a different perspective on it. In this case, it was the favelas and all the problems there is with uh, with having the police there and how everybody's suspicious all of a sudden with the Olympics and the World Cup coming and mm -hmm. so on. So it was again rich people saying police should be there and the people there, say, I mean, the classical um, problem you find everywhere in the world. But I wanted to express this from a different angle and, and, and also say that police does what police has to do and narcos do what the narcos have to do and, and so on. Try to, uh, try to just uh, dilute the debate. And sometimes it's successful and sometimes no, but I do it because I, I, I like, uh, I, would, I would prefer the world to be explained to me from mm -hmm. that angle. I try to explain things like to people that are not like uh, academics or anything like that. So, so in fact, you're, you're quite a political photographer in one I sense. I am. I Very am. much so. I am much very more so political. than perhaps people think. Yes, people think that I am all about like dressing up people and making all of it. Actually, everything comes from uh, 
from my worry towards how the world is explained because I think most of the problems come from us not understanding really what is going on because it's been explained over and over with the same words in the same way. So maybe if we just change things, we can find solutions. I don't know. And, and then, of course, uh, more recently, well, it's now just under two years, you actually decided to apply to Magnum. And mm -hmm. in a sense, uh, you know, you could argue you're the most unlikely magnet <laughs> photographer you could possibly get. So first off, what made you think about that as a, as a possibility? Um, and secondly, how is it going? First of all, it was, it came after a conversation I had with Alex Majoli in, in Lagos. Uh, we were having like a round table in Lagos Photo Festival uh, talking. I can't remember how it was, but... Uh, we actually just ended up saying, oh, of course, you're from Magnum. You don't understand how, you know, and I was, of course, oh, you know, because I didn't understand Magnum myself also. Uh, and then we talked later after that round table where we didn't agree very much. Uh, and Alex went through all, like, this is Magnum and this is the photographers in Magnum. And this is actually, he made me look at it deeply. And, uh, and I realized that it could also be the, first of all, I needed allies. <laughs> because if I was a bit tired of rowing against the current by myself mm -hmm. and I realized it could be a, a good a good move for me and um, and I don't know I think every photographer uh, at the beginning of her of their career um, can dream of Magnum so there's something if you don't like it uh, or you have uh, issues with it or don't agree with whatever they're doing it's there so I just wanted to try and see what happens and to my surprise it went well and and I'm super happy. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I really felt, I now really feel that I have a, a team like backing me. And mm -hmm. that's... Mm -hmm. Because the that's irony it. is that, uh, you know, Magnum's old association is with that humanitarian photography. The very thing, of course, that you were trying to escape from way back when you started your career. Yes, but uh, I mean, the ideal for me would be to go back to the media, but with my language. I mean, I, I'd rather be in newspapers and magazines than in museums, if you if you ask me. Yeah. Really? Yes, because I, I, I really believe in the media and how and explaining the world. I mean, in a, to a gallery, it's just a few people, privileged people and, and collectors or people interested who go. But newspapers are out there and publications mm -hmm. are out there, at least from for now. We'll see in the future. But for me, ideally, it would be to go back to to the media, to newspapers or to magazines, but with my language. But of course, I assume now, well, we know that you embrace uh, social media very strongly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Instagram, for example, mm -hmm. is an important outlet for you. Uh, but in a sense, you could argue that uh, the old media that you're talking about is in fact dead. Yeah, it is. Ri but yeah. there is still and, platforms uh, and, and we still haven't found what is a solution, but uh, but there will be, there will be one. But for me, it's I believe in mass dissemination of the work rather than individual mm -hmm. prints or so or, you're uh, a populist at heart i am totally <laughs> but i mean here we are talking about uh, you know some of these books very small editions yeah. 500 uh some of them when they sell out they become very expensive it almost sounds as if it's going against the very thing you believe in yes i'm not being very successful <laughs> in my planning i'm not a strategist but <laughs> i told you in the beginning there's things that really went out of control especially with the astronauts and and i think if i had a bigger structure i would try to make bigger editions uh, but also most of these uh, most of these projects are also available online and some have specific websites like this one mm -hmm. and uh, so i also try in my capacity to to make it available to the most people also exhibitions i've done many more exhibitions than books and that's a, a good way especially in and festivals. i assume if you're doing work in lagos uh, the priority is to show the work in lagos yes and how does it get received well it's a uh, that's it's, it's difficult to know uh, always well i don't know if you ever went to an exhibition of yours and people come to you saying oh this is really bad work or i don't <laughs> like it it's never happened to me did it happen to you uh, generally no, no because if they just... say that if they think that they don't say it yes that's a thing you never really get to know how what is the honest reaction but i was uh, very worried when i showed the astronauts in africa for the first mm -hmm. time because it's quite sensitive and I was. And where did you show it for the first time? In, in Lagos Photo. Okay. And then it was it was in South Africa also, and uh, because I really wanted to know what was the take on Africans, if they thought it would be like offensive, which was mm -hmm. not very far from my intention, and the only way to find out was showing it there. And they took it as uh, British people could take James Bond, <laughs> 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 which is what I I was very relieved with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But when you, I mean, how do you actually get Lagos slum dwellers to come to an exhibition? They probably never have 
any grasp of what an exhibition looks like. Well, that's part of the festival's uh, work to do. They, they do have a lot of activities, and specifically Lagos Photo. They do work with communities, with Makoko especially, and other communities, and they have programs where they train photographers. I mean, that was in 2015. And since then, and it's just four years, uh, there's been so many... Nigerian and African photographers that have mm -hmm. actually launched yeah. their career through yeah. that festival. So No, I, I think Lagos Photo Festival is an exemplar yeah. example. We, of, we of met that. there also. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> of, of them doing that work. Likewise with Multistory here in the UK. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know them mm -hmm. at all. There's a big festival now in, in West Bromwich called Blast. Oh, I haven't seen it. Which is that. very much about yeah. addressing the community. Oh, that's right. So it's interesting that, uh, you know, you appear on the outside to be a, a very arty, arty person. And in fact, you're fundamentally a community photographer try to work and find a, a living. Uh, Would you agree with that description? Yes, maybe not just a community photographer. I love working with community, but I think uh, even if it's not the right thing to say to gain uh, uh, an audience, but uh, I, most of the work I do it because I really care about the world and, and understanding the world that I live in. And I assume that people might have the same curiosity that I do. So I just create pieces of work, of information that I would like to share to everyone. But is it, a, is it a point of trying to change the world or are you just very happy to observe it? I'm not an activist. I'm an observer and I just think that my point of view can eventually, and, and it's, very, it's being very presumptuous, <laughs> but maybe a different point of view can help like de-block, unblock uh, the, the the narrative and also bring new solutions. I'm not, I, I'm, I won't bring the solution. I will just... Mm -hmm put the camera in a different angle and eventually help others understand things differently. So you've now settled in Brazil with mm -hmm. your newly found husband <laughs> and uh, you're now seemingly building a house. It, mm -hmm. yeah, what sort of house are you going to erect and how, and how are you going to relate to that community where you're from? Uh, well, it's impossible not to relate to the community there because it's like really, it's not, it's not a city where it's, there's not, hardly any privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, going there. Small city, big city. It's a town. very small. It's like a village. It's maybe twenty five thousand people. It's really small, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know. There's there's lots of things going on. Many things. The house. I will finally have a studio because I never had a studio, and maybe that will impact my work more than than I want, <laughs> because I will feel very comfortable and home and see. And also, there's this very strong connection with nature, and animals and wilderness and so on. And with the community, I don't know, Bruno and me have a lot of projects together and he's, uh, he's much more involved because he speaks the language much better than me. But I'm sure it's still too soon to know because we've been there just for hardly one year. I still don't have the house. but mm -hmm. uh, So you're building a house right yes, now? in the jungle. From, from the scratch? I mean, from is, scratch. Is you, are you and Bruno physically building it? No, we're not. No, no, okay. no, no. Just checking. <laughs> no, that's the first connection we have the co with the community. <laughs> we need people to help <laughs> and to hire. Yes, yes. And do you say to him, uh, I'm going to travel less in future? Yes, of course. And do you believe that? No. <laughs> I don't either. I, I, I will try. I will really try. But okay, so we can start a club of trying to travel less. Yes, let's do that. Okay. And we can share the excuses. <laughs> you give me yours, I, maybe you come up with a good one. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Christina. Great to Thanks speak Martin. to you. Thanks, Martin. Yes. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. <laughs>